I invite you to be in Mark chapter 9, verse 38 through 41 is what we're going to be reading, just uh, continuing on uh, through this chapter, ending it actually. Let's begin there in verse 38. John said to him, meaning to Jesus, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Now, my dad never met or knew his own father. He talked to him once on the phone on one rare occasion, and his dad told him this, I don't have a son named Asensio. So he denied even knowing him, knowing of him. And so having that disconnect with his own father, one of the values that my dad instilled in me and my younger brothers, Joey and Shannon, was this fierce sense of what he would refer to as familia, as family. You be loyal to one another. In fact, he would on occasion remind us in Spanish this, this phrase, it's sangre es sangre, which means not sangria, that's the wine, but sangre, it's blood is blood. What he meant by this was that what he was trying to instill in us was this sense of, look, everything can go wrong. Everyone is going to abandon you except this guy, your brother, Joey and Shannon. And that's what he was trying to instill in us, this sense of loyalty. And I've held on to that truth since I was little. And I've instilled it in my own sons. And it found it echoed throughout the pages of Scripture. And as a new believer years and years ago, this was something that I found very attractive about Christianity, that it really it resonated with me. That sense of loyalty, that sense of blood and family, all of that meant something very near and dear to my heart. And I, and I took it to heart. So once I had repented and trusted in Christ, God had sovereignly saved me. When I went into a church, I had this sense of, I belong here. I'm supposed to be here. Because I'm blood-bought just like you're blood-bought, and now we are family. You're my brother, my sister, maybe an older uncle, you know, but we're family, whatever. We belong to one another, and there's a sense of loyalty, camaraderie, family. And here's one beautiful example of what I'm talking about. It's found in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. There he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. This is what I'm really getting at. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. How did Jesus love us? He loved us so much that regardless of who we are, our past, unconditional love, he sacrificed himself to the point of going to the cross and dying for us. This is the way he loved us. This is the way we're supposed to love one another, this unconditional, sacrificial love. And by this, by this kind of love on display, all people will know that you are my disciples. You're my followers. You're my children. We are family. If you love one another this way, this is what it takes. Not sure if you've noticed, but despite our Lord's admonition to love one another with that kind of love that he's loved us, I believe the church as a whole, not just here, but as a whole in the United States, perhaps in the world, is more fractured, more unloving towards each other than we have ever been in a very long time. Much like the world around us, we are being told that we must be divided along racial lines and otherwise. And the result has been devastating for the unity of the body of Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. In some cases, I believe separation is necessary, even loving. Because unfortunately, some of my fellow pastors and some of our fellow Christians have added to the gospel to such a degree that it has become a different gospel. And what I mean by that, and I've been preaching about this recently, it's like, okay, so here's the gospel. Jesus, fully God, fully man. 
He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose again. There it is. Now you must repent and you must trust in that Jesus and those works that he did and not your own. That is the gospel. But now we add to it. Oh yeah, but we have to add to that gospel issues. It's not enough simply to share that gospel. That's not going to cut it any longer. Now you have to act upon that, add to it. It's not act. You have to add to that some other kind of endeavor, some other work that then justifies the gospel in the first place. In other words, if you don't put these works in front of it, such as you got to vote a certain way, you have to hang out with a certain people, you have to post certain things on your Facebook stuff, you have to be a social justice warrior, I'm just going to say it, and if you're not willing to do that, then you're not going to be able to effectively share the gospel you have added to, you have perverted the gospel, it is a different gospel, and it does not say. And so sometimes it's good to be divided because now they've perverted the gospel. In other instances, they've added to the scriptures, undermining its authority and its sufficiency, which again is, of course, also a grounds for saying, you know what, I don't know if I can hang with you because you no longer are preaching the same gospel that I find in scripture, and by doing so, you have undermined the authority and the sufficiency. Obviously, God's word is not enough. Why? Because the gospel evidently is not enough anymore. It's just not relevant in these trying times. It's weird too, man, because you can hear some of these guys six months ago, eight months ago, preaching the same gospel. Since four months ago, oh, you gotta do this. With all that said, where does it end? Are we supposed to cut fellowship with all other churches, all other Christians that are not inside our little group, our little tribe, if you will? I don't believe that for a moment. So then what are the things we can agree to disagree about with other Christians and still maintain fellowship, acceptance? And what are those hills that are worth dying for where you go, look, everything but these things? The deity of Christ, the gospel itself, the authority, the sufficiency of scripture. There's a handful of things. The trinity itself, the person of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Those types of things. Does scripture give us guidance on how to accept one another? Now last Sunday we looked at the three requirements for following Christ and here they are real quickly as a reminder you must trust in the sovereignty of God you must serve others and you must care for the powerless and moving on from there we are going to answer the question should we accept Christians we disagree with as our brothers and sisters in Christ can we still have some form of fellowship with them and my intent is to enable you To follow Christ just as he commanded. Again, this all flows from the center. Mark 8, 34. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so what I find interesting and even troubling about myself in particular and others as well is that although we would all agree that anyone who is drawn by the sovereign grace of God can follow Christ in this manner meaning in denial of themselves, taking up their cross, following after him. We can all do that because of the sovereign grace of God. We tend to limit that following based not so much on God's standard as revealed in Scripture, but rather based upon our own personal prerogatives, preferences. What I'm getting at is this. Are authentic followers of Christ limited to those you approve of and agree with? Or is there room for all of those God has called? Regardless if you agree with them on every little point, every bit of doctrinal minutia. Let's find out. Here's our question. Should we accept Christians we disagree with as our brothers and sisters in Christ? And here's our first answer. We should if our sinful pride and petty jealousy or the real issue. Our stuff. Not them, but us. Look at verse 38. John said to him, again meaning to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. 
So let's start with the disciple that came running up to Jesus with the shocking news that someone was freeing poor people from the bondage of demonic possession all in the name of Jesus. That's weird, right? Like he's freeing people from demonic possession, which should have been like, yay, but it was nope. We're ratting him out. And of course, we're talking about John of the Gospel of John. So who was he? Well, for starters, his father was a fisherman named Zebedee from Bethsaida, which is located on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. His older brother, James, was also a disciple of Christ, and together they were known as the Sons of Thunder because they were okay with calling down lightning on those that didn't love Jesus in the same fashion, the same way that they did. Regardless of this rather unsavory flaw, John was a member of Jesus' inner circle, made up of himself, his brother James, and of course Peter. As such, John was an eyewitness to a number of miracles and important events, the raising of Jairus' daughter, Jesus' transfiguration, which we just looked at, and upcoming, the agony at Gethsemane, where he's praying through the night, the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus taught about the signs of the end of the age. I mean, think about it. Here was this young man, maybe in his late teens at the most, And out of all the millions of people throughout the world during his time, John was one of the three young men that had this kind of exclusive access to Christ, the Messiah, God in the flesh. I'm just going to guess that despite being known as the beloved disciple, which we interpret to mean that John was reserved, humble, unassuming, despite his nickname, Our understanding of it is not necessarily true, is it? Again, John, being a young man, was impulsive in his decisions, driven by intense passion and zeal for the Lord. For example, he once told Jesus that he was prepared to drink the Lord's bitter cup of suffering and be baptized into his fiery baptism. He's like, yeah, I can hang with all that. I can do it. I left a very profitable fishing thing that I could have inherited to do all this. Surely I can do that. So he thought a lot of himself, obviously. No doubt Jesus loved him. But quiet, reserved, humble, nah, not so much. No, the impression I get from the biblical account is one of a passionate young man that struggled with the sin of pride that led him to become very territorial in his relationship with Jesus. As far as he was concerned, it was an exclusive club, and he and the other disciples guarded the access door to Christ like, I don't know, pit bulls chained to an engine block in Bloomfield. You know what I mean? Everybody's seen that neighborhood and lived in it if you lived in Bloomfield. And so they had this jealousy issue in regards to their relationship with Jesus Christ. We see this in what follows in verse 38. It it just comes out very clearly. Again, notice what he says. Now that we have a picture of John's background, notice what he says. Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons. It's all good. He's doing it in your name. And then let's stop right there for a moment. Because there's more, but let's stop. Now then. Let's talk about demons. And here they are. Here's here's a biblical definition. They are evil spirits, evil beings, or angels that sinned against God and are continuously working evil in the world, even now. We tend to exclude the possibility of demonic influence or diminish their role in our world today due to our tendency to evaluate or rather elevate modern science and our own reasoning above the objective truth of God's word. But what does scripture tell us about demons? Here's one instance. Ephesians 6, you all know it well, verses 10 through 12. Here the admonition from the apostle Paul is, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So he's encouraging us 
You need to really trust in God for what I'm about to tell you. Find your strength in him. And then what does he tell us to do? Put on the whole armor of God. Why? Because there's going to be an onslaught. There's going to be a battle that comes towards you as a result of repenting and trusting in Christ. If you're a follower, you need to be well armed. And so he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of who? The devil. This is a reality. This is something that we are contending with. We are in a battle, and most of us live as though nothing's going on. Like, nah, maybe, but probably not. I've never seen it except in movies. That might happen in deep, dark Africa, but certainly not in modern Farmington, New Mexico, where everything's just great. No, he's telling us that this is for all time, all places, all Christians. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In other words, demonic beings, fallen angels, whatever you want to throw on top of that. This is a reality. I think we see it now on a grander scale than perhaps we've ever seen it before. Simply turn on the news and you see some of the the evil things, the twisted thinking and justification for what's going on in our country. And you get the impression. I'm sure you guys have said it, right? You've looked at some news reports and you go like, who does that? Why on earth? How on earth did they come to that conclusion How do they think this way? Here's the answer. It's not just simply like, dude, they went to the wrong college. Look, I agree, they did. But why? Because no doubt, and I know this sounds like old Puritan preaching. Thank God for old Puritan preaching. Here's why. (laughs) I know this is so stupid, right? You guys are going to laugh at me. The devil. Demonic forces. Spiritual beings. And I know we want to smirk and we want to, yeah, whatever. What did I just read? Either this is true or it's not. So there are spiritual forces at play. Have been in the past. There are now and there will continue to be until the Lord comes. So obviously there's still a spiritual battle raging. And this is what John was observing Back to our text, a spiritual battle in which an unnamed person, this one man, he was casting out demons. He was engaged in spiritual battle. He was casting out demons in the plural, all in the name of Jesus Christ. By the way, doing anything, including the casting out of demons in the name of Jesus, means that the individual doing that, he was doing it in the power and the authority of Christ himself. You see, a person's name, the name of Jesus, was intended to capture that individual's character, meaning the distilled content of who that individual is. By casting the demons out out in Jesus' name, this guy was essentially stating this, I cannot do this in and of myself. I don't have the authority. I don't have the power. Therefore, I'm casting you out, demons, by the power and authority of the one who can. Jesus. This is all that he was doing. So far, so good. So what did John and evidently the other disciples do in response to this rather amazing miracle? Did they thank God that others, besides themselves, you know, were doing great works, mighty works, in the name of Christ? Did they encourage the man that performed the miracle like Way to go, man. You're doing this all in the name of Christ. God bless you. How can we pray for you? No, none of that. Did they talk to the person that was freed from the demonic possession and minister to him or her in some fashion? Did they point others to this individual and to this instance uh, to show them the glory of God? Nope. What did they do? Well, they did exactly what so many of us do. When we see someone else doing great things for God and we are, for whatever reason, not. What does John say? We tried to stop him. He was doing all of this, casting out demons, miraculous, mighty works, 
all not in his own power or authority or for his own popularity or power. He was doing all of this in the name of Christ, in your power, your authority. And so we were going to shut him down. Obvious thing to do. So this word stop, koluo in Greek, means to hinder, restrain, to physically hold someone back. Evidently all to no avail because the man cast out, again, demons, not just a single demon, but plural demons, implying that he just kept going on, regardless of what the disciples said or did to him. And I dare say we know why. It doesn't tell us in the text. I dare say he kept going on because he was far more concerned with those that were demonically possessed than he was about the approval or the opinions of even the likes of John and the other disciples. You see, that's an amazing thing, right? They're supposed to be the power and the authority. They're the ones hanging out in close proximity to Jesus. He's just simply casting people out. I don't even know if they had met. Maybe he had seen something. Maybe he had come to believe in some fashion like many Gentiles already had. But his proximity was different. He wasn't one of the 12 is what I'm really getting at. And so because of that, still he was doing this fantastic thing. And he was doing it not for the notoriety, none of that. Just simply because here's people that are hurting, that are in need. I'm going to do this in the power of Jesus Christ with his authority. Now then, why did John and the other disciples act in such a strange, territorial, defensive way? Why did they try to stop him from doing something that was obviously such a blessing? Look at the end of verse 38. Because he was not following us. Did you guys get that at the end? There are so many things wrong with this statement, right? For starters, John, speaking on behalf of the disciples, had apparently come to the conclusion that they were worthy of being followed. Like, hey, he's supposed to be following us. And if he was, then, you know, game on. Go do whatever. But you need to talk to us first. It was as though John was saying, you know what, you can't be doing good works in the name of Jesus. If you don't have your 12 disciples club card, you know, our approval... Their stated reason for attempting to stomp him was this. He he was not, again, following us, meaning that he did not hang out with them. He didn't seek their approval. He didn't submit to their authority. And although he did it all in the name of Jesus, he didn't mention the 12 disciples club. They didn't get any credit. Where's theirs? That's kind of their attitude. Where's mine? You almost get the impression that John would have been cool with it all if the guy had simply cast the demons out and said, hey, I'm doing this in the name of Jesus. Of course, we're going to cover that base. But also, John and James and Peter and the rest of the club. But he didn't. Therefore, he was illegitimate in their eyes. He should be stopped and restrained. uh, restrained. In other words, canceled. Canceled. We've all heard that term, right? We know what it means too, right? It's like if you don't agree with us, no matter how stupid and sinful it is, we're going to cancel you, which means everybody's going to hate you. Everybody's going to cancel you in the sense of you're no longer relevant. We're not going to go to your store. We're not going to buy your beans. We're not going to do anything. It doesn't matter because you don't agree with us. So we get to cancel you. By the way, that's not just happening in the you know, media or on the streets. It's happening in churches as well. This cancel mentality. Doesn't matter how good the miracle is. It doesn't matter if it's done in the name of Jesus. The 12 disciples were acting like the woke mob and the woke church that mindlessly follows them. So the first sin we can identify in the actions of John and the disciples is this. Pride. Self-centered, good old-fashioned, this is all about me. Wasn't following us. Where am I at in this whole picture? Yeah, yeah, you cast out the demons. You did it in the name of Jesus. Where is mine? And it's not there. Therefore, you're canceled. You're going to shut up. You're going to listen 
to us all pride. And you know, the sin of pride, it never stands alone. It's fertile ground for a host of other sins. And in this case, this case is no different. And we see this a few verses back. We see why they really threw the fit. It has nothing to, hit, to do, well, it has a lot to do with them, not following them. But it also has something, uh, there's something else going on. Look at Mark 9, verses 14 through 18. Notice what happens here. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them, meaning John and the other disciples. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and they ran up to him and they greeted him. And he asked them, that's a Castillo, so yeah, you got to go. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) So kidding. Anyway, back to it. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams, and he grinds his teeth, and and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples, meaning John and them, to cast it out. They were not able. Do you guys get that? He was casting out demons in the name of Jesus, and he wasn't even part of their club. He was getting it done. They were trying as hard as they could, all of them, and not a single one of them by themselves or corporately could make it happen. And so they were jealous. He was doing what they were unable to do, cast out demons. Look, I understand that we are to be discerning, and there is a biblical biblical command to test the Spirit's As we're told in 1 John 4, 1, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit or do mighty works. It doesn't matter. You can expand on that. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God, for there are many false prophets in the world. So I get all that. And I would encourage us all to evaluate others through the lens of Scripture through prayer, in other words, look at others through the eyes of God rather than your own to the best of your ability. If we do that, instead of immediately discounting what God is doing in and through others out of our own pride and jealousy, as we see evidence, even among the best of us, the Apostle John, When we look for God's kingdom, meaning God working and reigning in the lives of others besides ourselves and besides our particular church, when we do that, that's when you can actually experience what it's like to deny yourself. You guys get it? I'm going to deny myself my pride, my feelings of jealousy. I'm going to set that aside. That's what I want. That's what I feel. It's not always right. Take up your cross. That means to die to yourself. Sometimes in the ultimate sense, giving your life. Sometimes little deaths every day, swallowing your pride, your jealousy, admitting that it's wrong before God, asking for forgiveness, and then follow Christ. And so these things are not opportunities for us to just get angry and mad and jealous and throw a fit. No, it's opportunities for us to evaluate. God, can you be working in this instance here and I'm not able to see it because of my pride and jealousy? If that's the case, forgive me, allow me to be restored and move on. And you do all that, again, through the Spirit and through Scripture. There's a biblical precedence for doing this kind of thing, evaluating people in this fashion. There's a place for us to look in Scripture for an example. And of course, the circumstances and the context are not exactly the same, but the principle is there. Look at Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 11. There it tells us that the very night that believers, that the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea, When they arrived there, they went to the synagogue, and the people of Berea were more open-minded than those of Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures. Do you see it? I'm not just going to jump to my pride and jealousy and filter everything through my own mind and reasoning. 
No, I'm going to go through scripture and to the best of my ability, evaluate everything who you say you are and what you do through that scripture and through the spirit. They searched the scriptures day after day to check up on Paul. By the way, day after day. In other words, they didn't jump to an immediate conclusion. You know? Oh, that guy dresses funny. He has to be a heretic and a loser. Not going to listen to him. You you see? And so they took time to check up on Paul and Silas to see if they were really teaching the truth. That's what is at stake. So there it is, the filter, the lens by which we discern everything. It's the word of God. It not only leads us into the truth, it purges us of our sinful pride and jealousy and a host of other things when we take the time to search the scriptures, to pray it out, to trust in the leading of the Holy Spirit in that way. Now then, secondly, should we accept Christians we disagree with as our brothers and sisters in Christ? Here's our second, our last answer as well. We should if Jesus does. Look at verses 39 through 41. But Jesus says, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Now let's start with our Lord's command, do not stop him. Jesus uses the same Greek word that John did back in 38. That same uh, kaluo, meaning to hinder, restrain, and even physically hold back. In other words, our Lord was saying this, just because someone isn't following you doesn't mean he isn't following me. I know that's a surprise for you, evidently, but there it is. As a result, don't stop him. Just because another believer doesn't have the exact same views on every aspect of doctrine or practice doesn't mean he or she isn't following Christ. Therefore, give it a rest. Let go of your ego. This is a fairly definitive statement on our Lord's part. And he goes further by qualifying it. He gives us three reasons why you should not try to stop someone from, in this case, uh, casting out demons. But in general, three reasons why you should not try to stop another Christian from doing good works in the name of Christ, meaning in his power and authority. So I'm going to run through these rather quickly. Here we go. Verse 39. Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterward to speak evil of me. The key to understanding this one is that phrase, speak evil of me, given the greater context of Jesus declaring himself to be Christ, that is God in the flesh, the promised Messiah, perfectly God, perfectly man in one, and that he would go to the cross to suffer and to die and three days later rise from the dead with those truths about Jesus in mind, speaking evil of him at the very least means this, that you deny his He is fully God and fully man and that he didn't live a sinless life. He didn't die on the cross for your sins and he didn't rise from the grave grave three days later. If someone is proclaiming the gospel correctly in the name of Jesus, even if they start off on the wrong foot and they don't have it all figured out, now I'm not talking about the gospel per se, but if they're casting out demons or they're doing good works, and they have an eye, like, I'm, I'm doing this because I love Jesus. I'm doing this because I normally wouldn't, but something has changed. or Something is changing in me. Do you, do you see what I'm getting at? That's where we find this, this gentleman that's doing this. And so if somebody's doing this, then he's not going to stay in that vague, ambiguous, doctrinal place for long. It's as though he's saying, look, if he's doing that, God's at work. Not just through him casting out demons, but in him. And so don't worry about it, John, James, Peter, me, you. God's at work. The next reason is found there in verse 40. For the one who is not against us is for us. So how can you tell if someone is not against us, meaning the church as a whole? Are they doing good works in the name of Christ? Are they preaching the same, that's key, not a different, the same Jesus we find in the scriptures, the same Jesus that we're proclaiming? 
If the answer is yes and yes, well, then there it is. Don't stop them. The last reason, verse 41. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Now, for us, a cup of water is kind of, you know, the least of our worries. You go to the faucet, you turn it on, you chug it, you complain about Farmington water or wherever you're at. But, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. It's rather insignificant. But if you were in between villages or not near a lake or a stream in arid old Israel, a cup of water is suddenly the difference between life and death. And that's what he was driving at. If someone who doing good works in my name and two is not against us but for us, if he's willing to sustain your life and bless you in physical and in spiritual ways, then make no mistake, he will be rewarded. Now, I want us to think about this for a moment. I know I've been troubled by it all week. And by troubled, I mean uh, troubled in my own attitudes, my own behaviors. I don't know if you notice, but I tend, me personally, I tend to like a good theological fist fight. I don't know. I've always been that way. It's not the best thing about me. I'm working on it. And this particular text... uh, really made that apparent that I need to. But I must admit that, you know, this text, it has put me in check. It's reminded me of two things that I hope you'll get from all of this as well. First, believe it or not, God has and continues to use people besides yourself, besides your church. I think most of us get that. I think this is harder for pastors sometimes to get. You know, you want to think the best of your pastors. I want to assure you, most of us are very competitive, territorial, and um, yeah, not perfect. That's the nicest way I can put it. And that includes your own pastor standing here before you. So, God has and does use other people, other organizations, rather than yourself and your church. And you could add to that list. This means... Other networks planting churches besides our own, Acts 29. There are other denominations sending missionaries around the world beside the Southern Baptist Convention. By the way, just for a quick footnote and as an example of how much I like a good fist fight, the SBC, I have no doubt, is going to be changing their name before the year's end just so that they can be politically correct and as woke as possible. But in any case, they'll come up with something, you know, the Great Commission convention or something like that. Secondly, I'm reminded that I don't have to fix or correct everyone I disagree with. I don't have to stop them if, like our Lord just said, if they are doing mighty or good works in his name. They're going to come around if they don't have it all figured out. They're for us and not against us. They're going to get their reward, not because of us or because they're with us, but because of Jesus. I'm reminded, finally, of what the Apostle Paul, how he handled this when he was in similar circumstances, although he wrote this from prison. And he was in prison for doing what? Sharing the gospel. Philippians chapter 1, 12 through 18. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, being in prison, has really served to advance the gospel. Man, I don't know how he doesn't, you know, he's in literally the hole. And yet he's, he's like, his toes are tapping. Why? Because his life is so committed to it, so focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ. This should encourage us. This should help us to note, take note, look to the gospel, Tim, and not be depressed, not be anxious. Look to the gospel. And then he goes on, verse 13, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest of my imprisonment is for Christ. In other words, he's still preaching gospel. And most of the brothers, he calls them that. Note that. Most of the brothers, what? In Christ have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. Are the, by the way, are those good things? No, those are sinful things. They're envious of who? Paul. They're in rivalry, competition with who? Paul. Hey, Paul's in prison. 
Let's get after it. And you would think he would be resentful. Like, if you're my real friends, you will go shut them down. You know, I'll preach them. Or at the very least, get in a fist fight in front of the whole church with them or something to make them illegitimate. He doesn't do any of that. So, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Like, oh, you see all the sheep that we stole from Paul? I hope he notices. That was their whole motivation. What does he say about it all? What then? It, that's like a sanctified, so what? You guys get it? The impression there? Who cares? I don't care. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. This is it. Nothing else matters. Is Christ proclaimed? Do they dress the same as we do? Do they worship the same we, we do? Do they partake of communion the same way we do? The same frequency? Do they hang out with the same people? Did they mess up that one time when they're on vacation and watch Game of Thrones? You, you know, whatever it is that you put as your criteria, you know, and you go, nah, they're not one of us. Paul's not doing that. He's saying, so what? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Why is he rejoicing? Because the gospel is going out. God in his sovereign grace is saving souls, even through the mouths of some people that are filled with the sin of envy and rivalry. And he says, yes, I will rejoice again and again. Look, what this means is that our joy, our unity that the church so desperately needs right now, our acceptance of others comes down to this. It always comes down to this. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. And so this is where we hang our hat. This is where we make our stand. This is where we filter everything. And we rejoice because the gospel is being proclaimed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your gospel. We thank you for your son. Being fully God, fully man, he lived for us perfectly. He died for us so that we can have forgiveness. He rose again so that we can have eternal life in your presence, all through repentance and by faith, by trusting in Christ alone. And I pray, Lord, that there are some here today that as we are going through this and we're talking about the unity of the church and accepting one another, Father, there are some that understand that they need to be accepted first and foremost by you. And so break them down right now and restore them as they cry out, right now for salvation and they in their own words in their own mind would just have that time of praying and crying out to you and begging you for salvation looking to Christ alone the Christ revealed in scripture that we just tried to faithfully proclaim father make that happen and for those of us that are guilty like myself of constantly looking at who's with us and who's against us father forgive us As long as the gospel's proclaimed, let us rejoice in that. Let us allow that to be that fertile ground for unity, for the sake of your kingdom, for your glory, that the world may know that we are your disciples. May you bless us now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we take a moment to prepare our hearts for communion, I want you to see that here here are in the elements This is our unity because this is the gospel on display. It's not just grape juice or purple drink or whatever you call it and a weird cracker. Get that off out of your mind. This is a picture of the heart of the gospel, the cross and what happened there. It is Christ's body offered up for you. It is his blood, his death, his sacrifice for your sins. This is the basis for our unity, for our fellowship, 
for us being brothers and sisters in Christ. And so take a moment and ask God to forgive you of your sins, cleanse you of them, repent of them, and then come with a clean heart before your Father's table as brothers and sisters in Christ. And and know this is what the unity of the church looks like. The gospel. You come.